spirit and truth. Father, as a deer pants for flowing streams of water, let our hearts pant for you. Father, we thank you for Jesus, your son who you sent into this world to live a sinless life, to die a sacrificial death on the cross in our place and to be raised so we could have eternal life. Father, we praise you for that. And Father, I just ask that now that you would draw us close to you. You would save those that need to be saved. You would strengthen those that need to be strengthened. You would give hope to those that need hope. And Father, we thank you for your grace. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. You may be seated. Welcome. It's great to see you again this morning as our children and our children's leaders head back to children's ministry. I'm, I'm so thankful for our children's ministry, for Olivia, for our children's leaders. So many of you worship one, serve one. You know, it's just, it's, it's a blessing to see how many have just kind of stepped in and are participating in that ministry and also for our worship team. All right, I'm going to ask you to take your Bibles, if you would, and find your way to Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. If you don't have a Bible, I'd encourage you to grab one of the black Bibles in front of you. You can find Hebrews chapter 10 on page 947. If you notice, I have a couple passages up here. Normally, we just go verse by verse through books of the Bible, but we're in this series right now called Kingdom Relationships, and we're doing more of a systematic study on what God tells us about relationships so we'll actually be moving to Acts chapter 2 in a few minutes. Well, Pam and I became Christians at Prestonwood Baptist Church in Dallas, Texas in 1997. And as with most Baptist churches, at the end of the service, the pastor would do an invitation and he would invite people in that were, that pe invite people to come forward that were interested in receiving Christ. It was an invitation. And people would declare their faith in the life, death, burial, res resurrection of Jesus Christ. And as people were applauding, the people, would, the, the people that came forward would go off into a decision counseling room to record their faith in Christ. And up on the screen was a sign that said, welcome to the family of God. And I'll, all, I'll never forget, I thought that was kind of strange. I thought, that, I, I thought it was kind of hokey. It's like, welcome to the family of God. Really? But the more I grew in Christ... The more I studied the Bible, I realized that really hit the point because they were joining the family of God because when we receive Christ, we become new creations. God is now our father. Other believers are our brothers and sisters. We have a new family, God's family. So for those of you that are in Christ, welcome to the family of God. I said that for the first time ever in the first service, and I thought I'd try it again. The fact is, we've been adopted into a new family. And whenever anyone in the New Testament was saved, they were saved into a community of believers. They have a family, and it's called the church. The church has always been about relationships. Our relationship with God which then overflows into our relationship with others. We've talked about that in these first two weeks, that we got to get the vertical right so the horizontal falls in place. If we're struggling with our horizontal relationships, it means that we have an issue with our vertical relationship. So we need to be very intentional about deepening our relationship with the Lord. What is the church? The church, the word in the, in, the, in the original is ecclesia. It's the called out ones. It's the, one God, it's the ones that God has called out, out of darkness and into his marvelous light. There is the gathering of God's redeemed people. So we are saved into the big C church, the community of all believers all over the world, but also a little C church, a local body like Hope Bible Church. The fact is, we are the body of Christ, the family of God. And your love for Jesus should spill out into love for others. I've talked about it these last couple of weeks. Get the, horizontal, get the vertical right, the horizontal falls in place. When you read the New Testament, and I pray that you are regularly, 
you don't read about disconnected believers. The, the New Testament knows nothing of disconnected believers. They're connected into the body. So the big idea of the message today is when you have a personal relationship with Jesus, you're part of God's family, the church. Do you have a personal relationship with Jesus? Then you're part of God's family, the church. Now, one of the purposes of this community is to help us to grow, to help us to mature. Christianity is not static. You're either growing and maturing, you're becoming more like Christ, you're growing into Christ to become more like him, or you're retreating. It's not static. But what you see in Scripture is this focus on growing and maturing. Let me give you some verses. This is not me saying it. This is God's word. Ephesians chapter 4. Paul says to the church in Ephesus, and he being God gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers for what? To equip the saints for the work of the ministry, for the building up of the body. So what our part of what we're doing is we're, we're building up the body of Christ until we all attain the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God. So there's, a, there's this movement towards, it's, 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 a, it's a dynamic movement towards, towards knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood. The purpose of the church is to help us to mature, to help us to grow, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ so that we may no longer be children. See, Parents, you're growing your children. Eventually, they're going to get out of diapers. Hopefully. Eventually, they're going to move on and go to school. Eventually, they're not going to be living in your home anymore. There's this movement. It's the same way with Christian Christians. So we may no longer be, be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitfulness and deceitful schemes. We'll keep it there for a minute. It's like... We want to be rooted and established in the faith so that we're not just chasing around with every doctrine. We, we, we've grown. We've matured. Like our kids can be easily taken advantage of. We don't want that for Christians. Let's keep going here. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way. Notice, it's stag- we want people to grow up into him who is the head, into Christ, from which whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped. When each part is working properly, it makes the body grow. So as you grow, the whole body grows. I mean, it's like what you don't want is like your whole body's growing, but your arm has become static. It, it just, it's, it's just not right. It makes the whole body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Let's look at Hebrews chapter 5. The writer of Hebrews says, for though by this time you ought to be teachers. Let me just say this. Many of you by this point should be teaching God's word. You need someone to teach you again the basic principles of the oracles of God. You need milk, not solid food. I mean, you've not graduated from the bottle. You still can't take steak. For those of you that like steak. I like steak. You need milk, not solid food. For everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness. Since he's a child, he's not grown up. But solid food is for the mature. For those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice. So it's not just hearing it, but it's practicing. It's living it out. We grow as we live out what we learn. That's the key. We want to we wanna live what we learn For those who have had their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. Therefore, let us leave the elementary doctrine of Christ and go on to maturity. Notice, notice the dynamic life of a, of a Christian. And, and, and I was thinking about this. For some, if we've been around Christ all of our lives, we can fall into the trap of thinking, I don't need to grow. I'm just like, I'm just going to, like... We've, we've been around it, but there's just this not hunger and passion and, and, and desire for the Lord. Let's look at what uh, Jesus says in Luke chapter 8. Remember when he talks about the parable of the soils? The seed along the path, the weeds, the thorns. 
And then he explains it. He says, as for what fell among the thorns, they are those who hear, but as they go on their way, they are choked by the cares and riches and pleasures of life. The result and their fruit does not mature. There's no maturing. We're called to mature, to grow. Finally, I'll go to Colossians chapter 1, verse 28. Paul, his desire, he says, him we proclaim, Jesus, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone, what? Mature in Christ. For this I toil, struggling with all his energy that he powerfully works within me. His desire, God's desire for us, our desire for you is that you would grow. Let me ask you, are you growing? Are you maturing? What if you're not? What if you're not growing? What if you're not maturing? What if you're not producing food, fruit? It may mean, like we talked about last week from John chapter 15, verse 5, that you're not connected to the vine. Remember Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abides in me and I in him, it is he that bears much fruit. It could be that you're not connected to the vine and then you have a much bigger problem than fruitfulness. Or it could be that you just need pruning. I don't know about you, but I would not, I don't, I don't, I don't love pruning. So how do we grow? How do we grow in community? Well, scripture informs us. First of all, we grow in large group gatherings. We grow in large gatherings. And we're going to see this in, in, in Hebrews chapter 10. Now, what you're going to see is the writer of Hebrews moves from doctrine to practice. He moves from doctrine or right theology to right practice. And you're going to see twice in this passage, starting in verse 19, he says, since we have, since we have. And then you have three let us. And the first two let us are vertical. The, the third is horizontal. I'll kind of repeat that. Look at verse 19. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is through his flesh. What he's talking about, since when Jesus died on the cross, the, the, the veil between the holy place and the holy of holies where the presence of God was, it tore from top to bottom. Now we can enter into that holy place. So he says, he says, since we have confidence to enter in the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is through his flesh, through his dying on the cross. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with a heart sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. So you've got this right theology that points them to the vertical. So he says in verse, in verse uh, 23, excuse me, in verse 22, let us draw near. Let us draw near to God. And then in verse 23, let us hold fast the confession of our hope. Both are vertical. But then he moves to the horizontal, to the relational. Verse 24, and let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works. Not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. So I want to look at four ways we grow in community, in large group gatherings or with others. And this is a, an outline I've seen others use. I've used it before, but I like the way it flows. First of all, we stir up. We stir up. We grow by stirring up. Notice what it says in verse 24. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works. Right theology moves you to right practice. That word consider, it means to think carefully with the thought of action. I'm just not thinking about it. I'm being moved to action. What are we to consider? How to stir up love and good works which has to do with others. You can't do this alone. In fact, this is one of 54 one another commands. There's, I think, 38 distinct ones. Some of them are doubled up on, but this is one of the 54 one another commands. 
And you can't do that in isolation. And we're to stir up. Notice that word stir up. It means to motivate, to spur on, to stimulate. We, we, our, our, our goal as Christians should be to stir one another up. Now, some of you came into church today needing to be stirred up. And you know what? I'm glad you're here. Because, listen, if, if you feel like you just need to be stirred up, you should be here. But some of you came here and, and you've been filled with the, with the word of God and the spirit. And you're walking in the spirit. And we're so glad you're here because you are here to help stir others up also. The, the fact is we should come to these large group gatherings the church with a goal, who can I stir up today? Who can I stir up to love and good works? See, as a believer, I'm called by the Lord to consider not self, not focused on me, but one another, to help stir up one another. We have some people in our church that are really intentional about that. That's why I think we have such a warm, welcoming community, and I'm thankful for that. And I would just encourage you, don't come to see what you can get, but come to see who you can bless. We grow when we stir up. A challenge for you. Each week, find one person you engage with. Maybe ask them some questions. Invite them to lunch. Invite them to your small group. Invite them to, to, to college ministry, to young adults, or to student ministry. What an opportunity. And when we, we, so we grow when we stir up. But secondly, we grow when we show up. So you can't stir up if you don't show up. Okay, that makes sense, right? You can't stir up someone if you don't show up. The fact is, when my theology is right, my priority to the church is right. Yet how often do we not show up because something gets in the way? It might be family. It might be family in town. I, I'll never forget, I had a guy tell me one day, you know, I didn't show up for church because I had somebody in town and I took him to play golf. You're telling the wrong guy. <laughs> it's like, why, why wouldn't you tell him that your priority is to go to church, not to play golf? And, and, and the fact is, he said, well, I, I've got the opportunity to share the, share the Lord with him. I said, but you're, what you're doing is you're, your actions are different than you, what you're saying. So often, it, it, it could be sports. It could be, I don't feel like going. It's good that we have live streaming, but also can be a danger. Because if you're watching it at home, and certainly if you're sick or something's going on, but, or you're traveling, but you're missing an opportunity to stir someone up because you've not showed up. We're not meant to be isolated. We're meant to be connected as a body. Read 1 Corinthians 12. It talks about the importance of each part of the body coming together. So let me give you some biblical reasons why we show up. If you've been around us at all at Hope, these, none of these are going to be new. To hear the word of God, each week we're going to teach the word of God. That aligns us with God and his word, but aligns us with each other. As each one is living under the authority and the sufficiency of God, we, we, we're now aligned with each other. But not only do we come to hear the word, but to worship the Lord. It's, it's like turning our hearts up. And some, you know, we encourage you to come with your hearts already turned to the Lord, but you're going to get here, and our, our desire always is that you would be just worshiping the Lord, that we would be the aroma, that, that our, our, uh, our worship and our, our prayers would be a sacrifice of praise to the Lord. Also to pray for one another. I encourage you to, to like, if you're talking to somebody, maybe they're sharing something that they've gone through, take a moment just to pray for them right then. Because sometimes when you pray for them, it reminds them of the Lord. To connect in community, you, you connect. One of the reasons we have done, I've talked about this, one of the reasons we have good coffee and good donuts is because we want you to connect in com community. I mean, it's just like we don't, we don't have donuts just because. We want people to, to be connected. It's also an opportunity to practice the ordinances. We, the last Sunday of every month, we go through uh, the Lord's Supper. We remind you of Jesus' body that was broken for you, the fact that his blood was shed to cover your sins, the fact that he's coming again. The other 
We do that the last Sunday of every month. We also practice baptism. That's our other ordinance. It's for those who have received Christ. They're now following Jesus and believers' baptism. On the 19th of February, we will be baptizing. If you've not been baptized since receiving Christ, talk to us. We would love to baptize you. Um, so we practice the ordinances. It's an opportunity to serve one another. We've talked about that. And, and finally, it's an opportunity to grow up. You're, you're growing up into the body of Christ. So we grow when we stir up, we grow when we show up, and we grow when we build up. When we build up. Look at verse 25 again. And let us consider, actually, let us cons- verse 24, let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some. See, some people have gotten into the habit of not meeting together. I pray that's not you. But encouraging one another. It's an opportunity to encourage one another. That word, uh, that word encourage, it's, it's, it's the idea of building somebody up brick by brick. It's a construction word. It's to build up. It's to encourage. Let me ask you, how many of you love to be encouraged? Go ahead and raise your hand. This is okay. Honesty in church is okay. You love to be encouraged. My guess is most of us love to be encouraged. So the question is, how are you at encouraging others? I, I think that's a really important for each one of us to consider. Am, am I, do I come with the idea of encouraging? Notice what it says. Not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another. We're called to all encourage one another, to build up. And you aren't being built up if you don't show up. But finally, we grow when we stir up, show up, build up, and finally when we look up. This could almost be the most important part of this. Not neglecting to meet together is the habit of some, but encouraging one another. And all the more as you see the day drawing near. As believers in Jesus Christ, something that should be like in the front of our minds is Jesus is coming again. And he could come today. How will we be found? And the fact is we will all stand before the Lord and give an account of our lives. How will we be found? Will we have been somebody that is growing because we're stirring up and showing up and building up and we're reminding people to look up. Notice what it says. And all the more as you see the day, the day is the day of the Lord. Notice it's capitalized. It's the return of Christ. Jesus came 2,000 years ago as a suffering servant. He died a sacrificial death in our place on the cross. He was raised on the third day so that by by turning from our sin and turning to Jesus, we can have uh, eternal life. But we know that he's coming again. He tells us he's coming again. And so we want to encourage one another and all the more, there's a sense of urgency here, all the more as we see the day drawing near. And see, what happens is this gives us the, the fact that we're being reminded that Jesus is coming again, it changes our perspective, what's important. Don't ever forget that Jesus could return at any time. That should really change us from the inside out. So when Christ returns, what will be important? Will it be what we've acquired? Will it be how our house looks? Will it be what people think of us? Will it be, you know, uh, will it be our promotions or achievements or any trophies? Or will it be the impact that we've had on other souls that God has put in our path? Let me read it one more time, verse 24. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. So we grow in large group gatherings, but also we grow in small groups. We grow in small groups. So let's turn to Acts chapter 2. If you have a black Bible, you can find Acts chapter 2 on page 857. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts. Let me give you a little background on Acts. In Acts chapter 1, Jesus has just ascended. In fact, he says in John, in in Acts 1.8, he says, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the outer ends of the earth. And then he ascends into heaven. This is is post-resurrection. He ascends into heaven. 
And he, he tells the, the believers, there's 120 believers at the time, he, he reminds them to, to, um, uh, to stay in the upper room. And then all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit comes. And they all start speaking in, in the word is glossas, in, in, in languages that were understandable to other people. It would be like, all of a sudden, you started speaking Spanish to me and I understood it. Or you started speaking German to me and I understood it. And then Peter gets up, Peter, the one that denied Christ, but because he had seen the resurrection of Jesus, he now preaches a powerful message. And he tells the, the Jews that they were the ones that crucified the Christ and they're cut to the heart and they say, what must we do to be saved? And he says, he says, repent, turn from your sin and then be baptized Look at verse 41. So those who received his word were baptized. And there were added that day about 3,000 souls. Think about that. They go from 120 people to 3,000 souls. What do we do now? Well, verse 42 tells us. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and prayers. And awe came upon every soul. And many wonders and signs were done, being done through the apostles' And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. When people were saved, they were saved into community, and they grew through those relationships. Now, hear me on this. This was not a program. They didn't get a committee together and say, we got to have a program for all these people. It's like, no, we got to get our arms around these people and teach them the truth. And it was a devotion. It was a dedication. Look again at verse 42. And they devoted themselves. There was something they were devoted to. They didn't just add Christianity to their lives. They were, it was a pure devotion. There was a priority. They understood what Christ had done for them. Many of them saw Jesus hanging on the cross. Couldn't even imagine that. Or if they didn't see him, they probably heard from many people. Many of them saw the resurrection of Jesus. I mean, they saw him die on the cross, and then three days later, they saw the resurrection. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 tells us that over 500 people who were still alive at the time, Paul wrote 1 Corinthians, they saw the Lord. So there were a lot of first, there were a lot of first person accounts. It rocked them. They realized Jesus brought them from death to life. If you're in Christ, that's you. So they were devoted to the Lord who saved them, which led them to not only love the Lord, but love his body, his church. And there was this fourfold devotion to growing in Christ. And we focus on these in our small groups. Again, it's not a program. Four ways we grow in small groups, and we'll see it right here in verse 42. First of all, through biblical teaching. Look at verse 42 again. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. That's gathering together to study God's word, which are the teachings of Jesus. 3,000 new believers needed to know the truth of who Jesus was, the history of, of, of redemptive history and how God had made all this happen what he had accomplished and what it meant for their lives. That's why we teach verse by verse through the Bible. We want you to know the truth of who God is and what he has done. Paul says to the elders at Ephesus, he says, I do not shrink from declaring to you the whole counsel of God. Like we don't skip over parts of the Bible that might not be culturally popular. And in our groups, we go through what we call our sermon series curriculum or we go through a guided Bible study. Sermon series curriculum, we take, we take questions from today's message and we give that out to the small groups and then they, they, they 
they, they work on them and they come and they discuss what they've learned. Or some are going through maybe a, a guided Bible study, could be on one of the books of the Bible. Biblical teaching. And then that's, cha- that's, that's, that's followed by a time of accountability where we apply what we've learned. Now, why do we have accountability time? Well, it, it's very clear from Ephesians 4.15. Notice what it says. Rather speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head of, into, our, into Christ. Let me, let me just give you an example. If when our kids were young, one of them, and I can guess which one it would be, continues to run out in the street, but I'm not saying anything to them or Pam's not saying, eventually something catastrophic could happen. Were we loving by not saying anything? What's the most loving thing we can do? Speaking the truth in love. Listen, you, you, you can't continue to run out in the street. Because if you do, these are the consequences. And what we want to do is kind of help them understand. And, and I might be a little bit more direct at that point. But, but that's the point with us. It's like we're coming around one another. We're, we're speaking the truth in love to help them mature and grow. So not only do we grow in small groups through biblical teaching, but also through fellowship. That word fellowship, it's the word Quanania. It means to share in or to participate in. It's a mutual involvement. True community is giving oneself to another. You can't be devoted to Christ and not be devoted to his body. And you can't develop community in isolation. Again, the vertical gets right. You want to be in community. And, and I know some people, they're less social than others. But this is not about being social. This is about being part of the family, the family of Christ. Being a Christian and not being part of a church or not being part of a a community is, is an oxymoron. And notice verse 46, it says, and day by day attending the temple, what's that next word? Together. And breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts. So not only large groups, but small groups. They would gather in houses for discipleship, for connection, for accountability, for mutual ministry. Third, we see they grew through the breaking of bread. This refers to meals for sure, but it also refers to the Lord's Supper. And it goes back to something I said a couple minutes ago. It's to be reminded of the finished work of Christ on the cross. Sometimes you come into a small group, you break out men with men, women with women, there's some accountability or even in large, in the, in when, when everybody's together. And there's a reminder of the gospel. And I think sometimes we need to be reminded of the gospel. If we say, like, I don't, if I'm not growing, if I'm not maturing, it's like I need to be reminded of what Christ did for me, that, that, that he paid my sin debt, that my sins have been washed white as snow, that, that, I don't deserve that. It's a grace that, that I deserve his, I deserve death, but he gave me life. And that should turn me from the inside out. And so often the breaking of bread, the, talk, the discussion of the gospel reminds us that this is not a duty, but it's a delight. The fact that our sins are forgiven We're called to love others as he has loved us. And finally, the prayers. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, the fellowship, the breaking of bread, and the prayers. Authentic community is developed when you pray for one another. And I I love this about our small groups. When you have time just to pray for one another, cry out to God for the others, intercede for others. Pray about what we learn. Pray about where we're falling short. Pray about what I need to confess and repent of. Pray about I need to love my wife well, that I need to love my husband well, that I need to encourage him. I need to, 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 to build him up or I need to build her up. See, a faithful follower of Jesus desires to grow in the relationships in community. 
And when there's growth through community in large and small groups, guess what you have? Fruit. Spiritual fruit. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to invite Johannes Bremiker up. And Johannes is our director of ministry operations. He's over all of our small groups. And he's just, he's over a lot of different things. But he's also, and we're going to bring up Brody and Kristen Thompson. And Johannes is going to do an interview with them about small groups. So I'm going to go off and sit over here while they chat. interview these two, um, one thing is very important for us. We're not trying to push anybody. We're not trying to pressure anybody. We'd like to challenge you a little bit, but everything you heard this morning is in the word of God. Amen? This is not our personal opinion, what you should or shouldn't do. This is God's word. And so with that, I would like to interview Brody and Kristen Thompson. Hey, guys. Um, Real quick, how long have you guys been coming to Hope? Uh, We've been coming to Hope for about two and a half years. Okay, all right. And uh, you have any kids? We do. We have a (laughs) small handful. There's five of them between the ages of two and eight. Wow, that's amazing. So let me ask you this. What's so important to you about small group that you do this to yourselves, trying to figure (laughs) out with five kids to go into small groups? Yeah, I mean, uh, for us, it's just a a non-negotiable. It's something that um, it's just as important as making sure we have three meals a day or, you know, it's just as important as going to the grocery store and making sure we have that food or paying the electric bill. It's just there's, there's nothing to negotiate about it. It's got to happen. Mm-hmm. Any challenges with five kids to figure that out? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> life. <laughs> um, I would say um, our schedule, his work, commuting, the kids, uh, they're involved in after-school activities, sports, babysitters, finances, um, all that stuff. But kind of like Brady said, the challenges have been overcome because as a non-negotiable in our life, we've put it in um, our budget for childcare. It's a bill we pay for our schedules. We don't schedule anything else on Sundays and on small group nights, different stuff like that. Yeah. I'm going to say something about these two that I didn't say in first service. Brody, your commute of your first, of, of your previous job, how far was that? It was 90 miles one way, so I was in the car 90 for an hour miles and a half. one way. And they made it to small group, but you know what? We, we see the prayer requests every week, and Kristen, the faithful wife at home, was praying every single week that l- the Lord would, would bring some form of relief because mm-hmm. it's so important for them to be a family, be together, and the Lord answered that prayer. Amen? Yeah. Mm-hmm. So God does answer prayer. I'm not saying it's bad to have a long commute, but if you don't <laughs> like that, and you want to have other priorities in your life than sitting in the car for three hours a day, God answers these prayers, right? Yeah. So what's your guys' encouragement? Because you also lead a small group now at your home. What's your guys' encouragement to the church regarding small groups? Yeah, um, really for us, five years ago is when we started attending a small group in a completely different state, different church. Um, and we saw how basically our own personal walk, our walk as a, as a married couple and even as parents grew dramatically and that's whenever we decided it was it was something that was non-negotiable. We made it so non-negotiable that if we weren't gonna we weren't gonna go to a church that didn't offer small groups. Um, as we moved here to Arizona, that was that was one of our key key factors was we wanted to make sure we could be involved, um, that it was going to be encouraged, that there was going to be a resource there that we could be plugged in with other with other believers. Mm-hmm. Awesome! Thank you guys so much for what you do. We love you guys. Yeah. All right. I really appreciate uh, Brody and Kristen, and um, you know I think it's not always easy, but when we make things a priority, that becomes a priority. And I said earlier, when there's growth through community in both large and small groups, fruit is the result. And you've seen it in their lives. You see it in so many of our families' lives here, but you see it in the text. In fact. Look back at verse 42. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and the prayers. And, and I will put up a, a, a slide that shows you the fruit. The result of growing in large gatherings and in small groups, you see awe, you see unity, you see ministry, you see maturity. It's all right there. No, notice verse 43. And awe came upon every soul. Awe. There's an awe of God. 
As, as the Holy Spirit is working, as we align our lives with the word of God, all of a sudden there's this awe. This is a new church. And they're, they're experiencing God in ways that they, they'd never experienced before. And awe came upon every soul. And many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. You see the work of the Holy Spirit through these that are just devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching, fellowship, the breaking of bread and prayers. So not only do you see awe, but you see unity. There was this togetherness. Notice verse 44, and all who believed were together and had all things in common. You see that word together again in verse 36. This togetherness brought a unity as they aligned their lives under God's word in fellowship. And they were reflecting on the gospel and praying together. But not only do you see awe and unity, but you see ministry. I mean, the fruit is overwhelming here. And it said, and they had all things in common, verse 45, and, and they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And, and, and day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts. This is not a call for socialism. This is a call for back 2,000 years ago for people that, that declared Christ. All of a sudden now they're kicked out of the synagogue. They, they no longer are able to do business with anybody that's part of the Jewish nation. And so there were needs. And so you see this church coming around them and taking care of the needs of those who'd received Christ. So there's this mutual ministry of caring for those in need and that their hearts were glad and generous as they could do that. And, and, and notice it led to a maturity. They're praising God and they're having favor with all the people. Think about that. Like, how would you like to have favor with all people around you? It's because of the change that took place in them. They became the aroma of Christ to those that are perishing. And notice what the Lord does. Notice the fruit. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Spiritual fruit. There's a call to connect into community as believers in Jesus Christ. The fact is when we realize the price that was paid for our salvation, that Jesus took our sin, that he paid our debt, that he's washed us white as snow. Should this not be a cause to worship him from our hearts, just an overflow of our hearts? To love him with all of our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind, ultimately leading us to love others? Shouldn't this cause us to grow in maturity when we really reflect on what Christ has done for us? I'm going to ask our worship team to come up, and as they do, I want to go back to Ephesians chapter 4, and I want to read back through Ephesians chapter 4 in light of what we've just taught. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and the teachers for a purpose, to equip the saints, that's you, if you're in Christ, you're a saint. For the work of the ministry, it's not just us, me, Pastor Dustin, Joe, Johannes, but it's for all of us. To equip the saints for the work of the ministry, for the building up of the body. It's just like our children's servants, they're building up the body. Those serving in our welcome ministry, building up the body. Until we all attain the unity of the faith, of the knowledge of the Son of God. We want to grow, we want to learn about the Lord. To mature manhood, we're not static, we're growing to the measure of the statute of the fullness of Christ so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by every by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine like we are rooted in God's word we know it we have other people that know it and they're going to get us back into the right place by human cunning by craftiness and deceitfulness in deceitful schemes rather speaking the truth in love we want to speak the truth in love in love we are to grow up in every way into him, into Christ, who is the head, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped. When each part is working properly, it makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. This message is a bridge 
from loving the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind, to loving our neighbors as ourselves, And we're going to move into individual relationships over these next weeks. And how our relationship with Christ will have a profound effect on your marriages, on your time with your children, on being single. And that's why we want to make sure we continue to grow. My heart is that this would be the desire of our hearts, that this would describe our church. For some of you, maybe you've never received Jesus as Lord and Savior, and I would just encourage you today. Confess your sin, repent of your sin, turn from it, and turn to Jesus as your only hope. Just pray, God, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God. I believe that you died on the cross for my sins, and I believe you rose again on the third day. We would love to welcome you into the family of God. But secondly, some of you, maybe you've not been growing, maybe you've not been maturing and this might be an opportunity for you to confess that to the Lord and to repent of it. The Bible says if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. That's grace. Father, we thank you for the shed blood of Jesus Christ. And Father, I pray that our desire to love one another, to stir up one another, to consider one another would be born out of a deep love for you as a deer pants for flowing streams of water, Lord. Let our souls pant for you. Father, I pray you would just move right now in the hearts and souls of all that are here. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. Let's go ahead and stand together, family, as we respond to his word today.